So Jochen, you are a long time DLDster. You have moderated the, one of the, some of the most interesting panels and interviews at DLD, discussions, debates, and the next two sessions are with you actually. And we're very much looking forward to the first session. But Jochen, I want to also introduce you first um, to the audience of DLD because here lately Jochen Wegner, who is the chief editor of Focus Online um, portal and more. You have just been elected as the most successful online editor or the most renowned online editor in Germany and especially I would say the most innovative because you were the first who said I want to build something that is that only Google has done which is Google News and that is Nachrichten D, right? Which is a fully algorithm based news portal, right? And that's one of your um, ideas lately. Um, Jochen is a scientist by training um, a, and he worked long time for Focus magazine and three years ago you moved over and to really transform Focus online into what is it now and you're someone really who understands networks and that is also maybe the bridge to our today's keynote um, speaker we have the CEO of Deutsche Post WorldNet, Dr. Frank Apple, who we call now on stage, and we hope we, have, we will have a very interesting half-hour discussion with. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Apple. Bravo. So I'm really too happy to, to have you here, because you're a chemist, I'm a physicist, you went to go on and had, uh, did some research in uh, brain research at the ETH in, in Zurich. Um, so that's quite interesting. And then you went to McKinsey, uh, have been a partner there, and then went to Deutsche Post, DHL, DHL the, the biggest logistics provider on this, on this planet. Um, and maybe your, uh, your group is the perfect place to study what happens to a lot of companies these days when it comes to financial crisis and also the effects uh, which the internet has on, on global business. You're transforming the company at the moment in a really high pace. Um, so, for example, I went skiing with some friends two or three days ago, and I, I was able to send with your new iPhone application a letter to my, uh, and, and a postcard with a picture of the glacier we were on to my friends via, via the internet. That are some services you are rolling out at the moment to change to change the whole company. Do you own an iPhone, by the way? No, I'm, I don't own an iPhone yet because if I would start to use an iPhone, I have 500,000 employees who would like to get one as well. <laughs> so therefore, <laughs> that's a bit a little bit a challenge. So I don't show these kind of toys all the time because you know then I would have that response and to. Fund it for 500,000 employees, almost impossible. Mm. But um, so the, the sign that, that Deutsche Post um, is publishing digital tools at the moment is, yeah, because the internet um, um, leads to a shrinking market, for example, in the letter market, you have something like three to 5% last year of, of falling, falling market. At the moment, you're serving something like 70 million letters per day, but it's shrinking all the time. So do you think there's a tipping point when it's not uh, profitable anymore to do that business due to the internet? Yeah, may, maybe phrase it in a different way. So, you know, the internet is just something which uh, came to life uh, because there was a demand from, from customers or consumers or scientists at the beginning. You know, they invented that to communicate better. Uh, so whatever happens is a demand from customers, consumers, so there's a huge chance as well for a company like ourselves um, to, to gain even market share and have new ideas to support the needs for customers and consumers. So we are working actually on that. We have, we are, because our core business, the letter, letter business, one of our core business, the letter business is under this enormous threat, but now we are inventing an online letter which has the same, you know, principal attitudes or uh, features as a, a letter. And that gives us some hope that we can make uh, you know, money somewhere else than in the historical um, uh, letter business. And beyond that, the internet would not work actually without having um, a logistics company like ourselves. Because you know, how should goods move? And you know, a significant part of the internet world is moving goods later on. 
if there's not a sophisticated network, network player, you know, it would not work because you can still get the information, but if the goods are not shipped, you know, then you can't, uh, you know, then the internet does not meet your, your customer expectation. So retail outlets have a competition through the internet because we ship the goods finally to, co to the consumer. Would you say that your business transforms into a, just a function of the internet? I, I think there are more because you know we have still a lot of business which is moving between plants of uh, producing companies, so there's much more than that. But it's a fundamental, you can call it the outer net supports the internet, but there's more because there are businesses which are just B2B businesses which are using you know, information technology for already a long, long time. So and that will remain in place because you can't, you know, with the decentralized manufacturing we have in the meantime in every part of the world, you know, you need also logistics companies there. So where is this, this um, logistics business um, heading at the moment? You have shrinking markets in the, let's call it letter business. You have a slightly growing market in the parcel business. So um, what, what would you think in five or ten years, where will all these, these businesses stand there? I, I, I think, you know, we have seen in the last ten years, except 2009, we have seen that our business has grown twice, at least twice as fast, our industry has grown at least twice as fast as GDP, and that will continue as long as there is a different uh, labor cost level in the different regions of the world. So that means we expect if a recovery of the economy is taking place, that our growth in all our business, except the mail business, will also again two times the, the underlying growth of the GDP. So there is still enormous demand for, uh, for new logistics solutions. So you have to find new solutions. I learned that uh, Deutsche Post doesn't have a dedicated research business. Why that? You are a scientist. Why don't you tell us how many billion dollars you invest in, in research per year? Yeah, we, ha we, uh, we are investing enormously in innovation, that's for sure. But it's very difficult to judge what is R&D spent and what is regular service improvement. And therefore, we don't ring fence that because it's, you know, it's, there's a very, very difficult line to pl put in place between what is R&D, as I said, and, and actual business. But we are doing a lot of new innovation products every day. You know, we have uh, carbon neutral products implemented in the last three years in many countries. Is the implementation, how you offset carbon emission, is that R&D or is that just a new service feature? So and there's definitely a lot of investment goes in that arena because, you know, if we want to reduce our carbon footprint, a lot of investment is needed. A lot of new f f features of products are needed. So the question is always, you know, what do you call R&D? And we are saying before we start and talking about numbers, which will be small in comparison to, you know, a, a technology companies anyway. So why we should bother about that as long as we create really the right innovations for our customers. So if you find, uh, try to find new ways to generate revenue, you have to come to really different thinking and different solutions. For example, I'm not sure if the audience knows that Deutsche Post basically runs the British health system. Uh, so maybe you can el elaborate on that. What's, what's the future of, of, of these plans, like you know, having a, the whole fulfillment uh, in, in a special area? Yeah, if you, if you think about consumer and even more customers, because NHS is a customer, it's a B2B business, you know, many of these customers have still very complex processes behind the scene. And if you can make these processes easier, you can reduce the complexity for the customers, and this is at the end of the day why, you know, services are successful. You know, if you think about all the internet services, you know, the applications you have on the iPhone, you know, they are so successful because they make the life for consumers, customers easier. And if we do the same, and we have done that for the NHS, the National Health System Service in, in the UK, we have reduced their complexity, saved them money, and that's the reason why they are so pleased and say that there was a great idea to outsource the complex processes they had before to a provider like DHL, and then you get the benefits, better service, better reliability of a service, lower cost, and that is exactly what will happen in many industries. Logistics services are still very complex, so there are still very broken steps in many supply chains. If we reduce the complexity, 
you make them more reliable, more standardized, lower cost, and that is exactly what customers are asking for. So there's unlimited potential for a logistics company if you are present in all regions of the world, as we are. So, you know, we have no limitation for future growth due to the need for many customers and consumers really to get better service on their logistics front. But are, are the margins higher in these fields where you have the whole supply chain? Yeah, principally spoken, if you reduce complexity, you have, for a certain time period, better margins. Because customers appreciate that you have reduced their complexity. That's the same what you see in internet. You know, you can't sustain. In some areas, you don't even have any margin. But in some business, you can only sustain uh, you know, the margins for a certain time period. And then they erode because they get commoditized again. So that's the same for complex solutions we provide. Yes, we have more attractive if you make the business right. If you ramp it up in the wrong way, then you have even negative margins. But if you do it right, you have better margins than in the standardized uh, business, uh, which you have already established and which is commoditized already. Let's come back to the letter business for a second, because at the moment you have a really acceptable margin of something like 10% there. And also the German publishers, for example, uh, these days announced that they want to go again into this, into this business. Um, I was wondering if it's really a long-term profitable business. What's your, your comment on that? Yeah, I know that many publishers are thinking still and as to have still an, uh, money invested in this, in this area of mail. And to be honest, I don't understand that. Because as a publisher, your own core business, which was paper-driven communication, is under enormous threat. And not many publishers have found yet a solution how you earn money in the internet. So now, you know, you spend your money in a business which is under enormous threat through the internet as well, which is called the mail business. And why, why are you investing money in this arena where you have a key player, which is us in that market, who is, you know, making a lot of money, but is under pressure as well because volumes are declining. So I don't understand the logic. Instead of thinking about how can I, as a publisher, how can I invest the money in businesses which are linked to the internet or to my core business, I'm investing now something into something which is very different. The only reason why publishers are doing that because they say, you know, I deliver the newspapers in the morning anyway. But the problem is if you deliver the newspapers in the morning, you have a very short time frame to deliver as well addressed mail. And if you do that at the same time to generate synergies, you probably expand your time and then the the customer of your core product with newspapers is not very happy that he gets the, the newspaper at 8 and not at 6. So I'm, I'm, I don't understand why publishers are so keen to go into a declining market where the key player has a lot of profitability, yes, but our profitability went down quite enormously in the last two years as well. So, so that's an interesting question. You better ask the publishers. I, I don't understand that. Mm. It's, it's also subsidized by the German state in the, in the way that uh, you, you don't pay special taxes. Uh, and so the margins are, are really high. But uh, the question is at the end, uh, is there something like a tipping point even for Deutsche Post uh, when it is, it's not, I, I asked that before, uh, is there a tipping point when, when it's not profitable anymore to have all these 80,000 you know, postmen running around and because everyone is just sending emails? Yeah, may, may I ask you, you know, this question I can't answer because we can't predict exactly you know, how much volumes will drop, but more importantly, because we fear that our, our profit will decline, we are investing in new innovation. So to a certain extent, with the online letter uh, where we try to transfer the mail, physical mail delivery into the Internet with the same features as a physical letter, that means it's secret and confidential just to the sender and re recipient, that we try you know, to build a new business model and cope with the change consumers do. If a consumer is not willing any longer to accept a paper version, we have to do something instead of sitting here with the risk that we cannot belize our own core business. But this is better so that we are saying, you know, we undermine our core business ourselves instead of sitting on the sideline and waiting until it's over. You will roll out these kind of digital letter envelopes in, in summer. So why, why should I use this service uh, as a normal customer? Uh, we have something like pretty good privacy software since de you know, decades, 10, 15 years maybe. Uh, we, especially in Germany, we have an infrastructure called the digital signature where you can basically do the same stuff. So why, why are you important as a player in this field? 
Yeah, the, the, the point is, you know, we have a transfer from the digital life to, uh, from the physical life to the digital life, and, you know, that's not black and white. So you have still the demand to get some things in paper version, some things electronically. That's the first, and we will provide exactly that combination, the idle combination to your needs. If you go home on a Saturday night, you will find letters on your desk where you have to make payments for your doctor, you know, for power, for the telecommunications, or at the moment you have different websites where you have to go. We want to bundle all these activities because it's much more convenient if you can make all these things on one site instead of having several sites, and you can even avoid paper at home entirely, and you have your archive with us so that you really can see the history and all this kind of stuff. So I think there is a huge market. You know, if you talk to people who are traveling a lot, you can, you know, instead of doing that just from home, you can do that from Singapore or the US because you can access the service from anywhere. If you're on vacation, you can still monitor what invoices came in. So I think there's a huge market. If you still want to have a paper version, you can still tell us, you know, I want to have and finally a paper version sent to my home. You have to pay them maybe even less, a little bit less than their regular postage. So you get the full-fledged service instead of that you have on one end some digital things and on the other some paperwork and nothing is perfect and we think the combination of both is the answer to the transition from the physical to the digital world. Just if you have questions to the biggest logistics guy on this planet just step up to these mics here please. Um, I had another question about um, our recent news that you gave back a huge airport, I think it's something like a three, 300 million invest in the US to, to the local town there. How could that happen? So it, it, it's connected with your huge, huge Im invests in the US, which basically seem to fail, something like six to seven billion uh, dollar. Yeah, maybe may not all of you know that. So we, we um, had a significant domestic express business, which is documents and letters in the US. We are still in all our other DHL businesses a big player, the International Express business, but also the forewarning business that means shipping of containers and pallets as well as warehousing. Uh, we retrenched from the domestic market and we had the largest privately owned uh, airport in the US. So, but if you retrench and you don't need any longer an airport, what do you do with an airport? And we looked into the different alternatives and we felt you know, because we have a responsibility for the community we lived in, and you know, this airport is not in a, you know, high high street area. It's pretty remote, so the region suffered as well from a retrench from the business. Uh, we felt the combination of financial interest and doing something for the community we we worked in, uh, the right decision was then to donate the airport to the lo to the local authorities. So we we did that. And I think that we got some respect from uh, the communities for that, for that step. And so we balance our commercial interest as well as our social responsibility to the community. As a scientist, you are used to learn out of failure because it's the, one of the basic principles of research. So what went wrong in the US? I, I think, you know, as there's many things, you know, we had the right idea to say we want to be a combination of international domestic uh, express company in the US as well, and that's always a starting point. Many ideas are right, but what happened, what w went wrong, uh, was the execution. So instead of being a separate, we, we didn't take a separate market approach to UPS and FedEx, we offered more as the same product uh, portfolio, instead of saying, you know, we are a value player and not a premium player in the US, and th that was probably the mistake, that we have the wrong execution. We have the right idea, but we executed it wrong. And that's in many cases with innovations as well. You know, many brilliant innovations never made it to, to the consumer because the execution was poor and somebody who had maybe a slightly less attractive solution but was faster with execution succeeded. So it's not always that you have the right idea, you also have to execute the right idea in a proper way. And, and we didn't do that. Fortunately, the Asian market works out better for, for Deutsche Post, I have the feeling. So you have something like six billion there at the moment, 50,000 employees. I'm not sure if, if the public is aware of that fact that you are the major player in Asia at the moment doing logis logistics there. Is it just due to acquisitions or what, what are the next moves there? Yeah, first of all, you know, the consumers and customers in Asia are very well aware that we are the leading logistics company. It's very often, you know, that you, if we take a German perspective, people don't know because they are more worried or concerned about their postal services. 
but indeed we are by far the largest player in the different businesses we are doing and we will use that with the recovery which appears to be taking place first in Asia that we will take benefit of that because we have a very strong foothold. But if you ask people in Asia, and I don't know how many far from Asia, they have no doubt they know about DHL and they perceive it as well as a very strong player in the logistics industry. So what's your investment st strategy there? So maybe 50% of the world logistics market will be there in some years. It will be much more. You know, the, I have no doubt Asia had 60% of the world GDP 200 years ago. And I have no doubt that Asia will have, in the next 50 years probably, they will regain the 60% GDP uh, part of the global GDP. Uh, and that means, you know, the growth will mainly intra-Asia, uh, much more than it was so far. You know, we still have inter-regional traffic, but we will see much more growth in, in Asia, without a doubt. So the effect of the financial crisis on, on your business was quite substantial, something like 16 to 18 percent drop in revenues last year. So you are the oracle, maybe. Logistics is the precursor of economics. So what would you say? What will happen this year? Will we see another drop or do you have the feeling that it will go up and we are all happy again? Yeah, you know, we are a leading indicator, but we don't know uh, the right judgment until, uh, you know, material has been shipped, goods has, have been shipped. And uh, therefore, I can't judge. But you know, what I hear from customers and um, and and read in newspapers sometimes, I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic that the worst is over, and we will see a recovery in 2010. Uh huh. Okay. So uh, when I asked you behind the stage how your fourth quarter was, you, you smiled. So that's also a good indicator, I think. Yeah, you know, we can't say anything about our fourth quarter because you know we are heading into the direction that we communicate that. But for sure, we will, uh, we will meet definitely our guidance we gave uh, the market. So I'm, and that's the reason if you are asked and you know that you will you make your guidance, you, know, you're, you can relax as a, as a CEO of a large company. So what did you learn out of the crisis, by the way? Did, did, what, what did you learn after this, this huge crisis also for your, your company? Are there any learnings? Yeah, Did you change something? Yeah, there are definitely learnings. You know, the most important learning is that you have to um, variableize your cost structure more than you might thought. Because, you know, these uncertainties and uh, disruptions which took place and you know, have a massive, um, you know, massive impact on any company. You know, we are a company which lives more or less only from the people who are working for that because that's our own asset. So we need to find new ideas how we can variableize without laying off people, you know, costs for our, our employees. And then they have more benefits if the economy is strong, but less than the economy is weak. And, and this will be a very interesting subject for the future. You know, how do you balance the interests of your employees over the cycle, expecting disruptions like we have just seen in the future again? With Postbank, you're also, in a way, uh, a banker and do you think the, the international banking system has learned something? Um, you know, that's a very tricky question, you know. You know, this is too difficult. To I can say that definitely Postbank has learned quite a lot. What exactly? You know, they are, they are definitely not as much invested in the, in the risk profile as they have been. So they have, you know, they have said we really focus on the business we understand, that is, you know, demand, you know, customer demand, uh, and uh, and then people who are fulfilling that demand for the for the customer, and that's their core strength, and they will focus. If bankers overall have learned, I think, you know, some have learned already more than others, and there's still a way to go. But recently, you you had a harsh critique on the on the international banks. Why that? I had a what? You 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 uh, well you you uh, were a, a harsh critique. Of, of you know the international banking system, which no, was what, what I said is that in the and you know I, I don't know what that has to do with innovation, but anyway, <laughs> so uh, because the fundamental belief I have is, forever, for, however you do business, you need at the end of the day customers, and you need people who meet the expectations of the customers, and the better the people you have are, the better you will fulfill the the customer need. What happened in the financial market is that there are areas where people are trading without having real customers or responsibility for employees. 
And that's the problem. And we have to look into these areas where people lost to serve customers. And some bankers don't serve. You know, they are trading on electronic systems something which has nothing to do with the reality, which means oil or you know, raw material or something else. So they are trading without having a real customer on one end or have responsibility for employees. And that is what I've said. I said, all business is based on serving consumer and customer needs with the best talent you can find. And you have responsibility for your customers and you have responsibility for the employees. If you lose that, that feeling that you have responsibility for customers and employees, you will lose as well responsibility. And that is a part, I think, of the financial market crisis we have seen. Unfortunately, our time is up. So thank you very much for coming. Thank you for all these insights. Thanks. Thank you.